edition of the Digital Grid Summer Webinar Series. My name is Omar Siddiqui with EPRI. I'm joined by my co-host, Liang Min of the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative. And uh, we're delighted to have you here uh, for uh, many of you. This is uh, probably a, uh, you know, not the first of these webinar series. Um, and so we appreciate uh, you uh, being with us again. For those of you for whom this is your first time, we wanna welcome you. Uh, we'll give some brief remarks just to give you some orientation about what the objectives are and what we plan to do for the series as a whole and then for this particular webinar. And we're delighted to have such a great group of speakers here on today's panel, which is a federal and state agencies, a government agencies panel. And we're really excited about the speakers we have lined up and the discussion to follow. So without further ado, just a few housekeeping items before we get started, everyone is on auto mute. Uh, we're expecting a lot of um, participants and people are uh, signing on now as we, as we speak. Uh, because of this, uh, the best way to submit your questions is through the uh, chat feature or the Q&A feature. If you look on your bottom of your screen, uh, you will see a little uh, floating cloud icon. If you click on that, that'll open up the chat window and you can submit questions that way. Liang and I will be uh, monitoring the, the questions that come in and we'll be asking questions uh, after the uh, presenters are concluded. Uh, you can also choose yourself as a, um, as a, spe as a uh, person to kind of raise your hand virtually and we can open up the audio line at that time. Uh, recommend the chat feature is the most efficient way for questions though. Um, and we are recording this session and so your participation is your consent to this recording, so thank you. And we will be posting the presentations as well as the recordings uh, to both the, uh, to the EPRI site and Stanford site. There'll be a link there and uh, we'll uh, point out where you can access this inf the information for, that'll be posted from this webcast as well as from our preceding uh, sessions. So uh, thank you. Uh, just a brief word. Um, EPRI and Stanford, we're, we're pleased to be co-hosting this activity. Uh, EPRI, we're an independent not-for-profit uh, research organization uh, focused on R&D for, for all aspects of the uh, electric utility business from generation to delivery to the uh, end use of electricity. And uh, we have a, a public benefit uh, mission, so our research is intended to uh, benefit the public and ultimately, we want to help advance through our R&D, um, keeping electricity service uh, efficient, reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible through collaborative research. Uh, just uh, with regard to Stanford, uh, the Bits and Watts Initiative, which Liang heads, uh, it's a major Stanford initiative uh, focused on the future of, of the grid and, and digital innovations uh, for the grid uh, for the next, uh, for, the, uh, for, for, the, for the future. And they focus on uh, business innovation, policies around uh, customer control and end user technologies. Uh, so really this, uh, this webinar series here is really central to both EPRI and Stanford's missions to advance, uh, to advance research in a collaborative uh, fashion and to get in, in all of industry perspective, including government in, the, in this case today. So our objectives for convening this webinar series is really to convene experts from multiple disciplines to exchange views and perspectives on what a shared integrated digital grid means. You see on the right some elements that are uh, part of, uh, of, of this vision. People have different perspectives and we want to understand um, what that is around the central theme of integrating customer resources to, uh, to serve as agents to assist in grid flexibility. Uh, Part of what we want to do is identify some critical gaps towards achieving uh, this vision. Uh, one of the themes that we've had recurring uh, through the series is the need for enabling data platforms that allow uh, information from customer devices uh, upstream to, to the utilities uh, to enable uh, a seamless transition of information and uh, actionable information. Uh, we want to understand from the utility point of view uh, what their requirements are uh, and to understand what technologies can be brought to bear to address these gaps. And we've had in previous seminars and we'll continue to have uh, leading technology companies as well as innovative startups 
talk about some of their uh, approaches to help bridge these uh, technological and data uh, gaps. And also to get a 360 degree view, the perspective of, of, of government agencies as we'll have today, uh, leaders in government sponsored R&D, regulatory perspectives and, and so on. Ultimately, what we wanna do through this process is inform an industry research roadmap towards this digital grid uh, vision and uh, to enable um, a collaborative research initiative uh, that is uh, you know, part, a large part of what EFRI does. And this webinar series will, is helping us in shaping and defining what this collaborative uh, initiative uh, will, will, will look like. And there'll be more information on that as we, uh, as we define that. And again, the view in integrated grid can mean different things to different people, especially you know, in a digital integrated grid. Uh, but the theme that we have been using here is the idea of integration of, of customer resources to uh, act as agents to serve and, and assist and optimize grid flexibility. So uh, that is uh, one of our um, key themes and we've had a variety of perspectives on, on what this means in actuality and, and how it can be achieved and what some of the gaps are. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Liang to um, uh, give a bit more background and talk about and introduce our speakers. So Liang, over to you. For the attendees and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar series. So a quick recap what we have done in June. And uh, uh, in uh, June, on June 9, 10, and 11, we have uh, three sections, virtual sections, and uh, uh, get together with uh, US utilities, European utilities, and uh, uh, information technology providers, and talk about what they are doing, what the challenges they have seen when they work with their customers, when, we, when they work with uh, uh, their utility partners in terms of how the customer DER is integrating into the electrical grid and the, what type of data platform they are using or they are thinking about using and the, what is the technology challenges they are facing. So if you miss the June webinars, uh, there's a recording available at both EPRI and the Stanford website. So uh, started from this month, from July 1st, we already conducted uh, uh, two panels. The first panel in July is about uh, uh, entrepreneurship and uh, uh, startup company. We get together three companies and talk about how uh, they work with their customers. And uh, uh, because the startup company is a relatively um, very flexible and uh, uh, working with their customers. And also last week, we had a university panel. We get together with two university researchers, discuss you know, the existing research they have been doing funded by either NSF or different uh, funding agencies. And today, you know, we are very happy and glad to have uh, three federal and the state uh, funding agencies here because we believe that uh, this innovation ecosystem, uh, the federal and the state agencies are very important part in this ecosystem. And uh, what we will have uh, in next several weeks, we will have uh, next week, we will have a corporate research panel. And uh, as uh, we all understand that, uh, you know, EPRI is one of the utility funding uh, agencies. We have a state, federal, but corporate research is also a very important piece in this ecosystem. Then start from August, we will kind of reformat the uh, virtual discussion a little bit instead of focus on different category of a stakeholder, we are going to focus on the technology, uh, technical topics. So the first topic we are going to discuss is how the customer DR can provide the value um, of resilience uh, based on the polling results we get from last week. Okay, now it's a show time. So today we are very glad again to have uh, Chris Irvin from the Department of Energy Office of Electricity. We have uh, John Lochner from Nasrda and uh, Eric Stokes from California Energy Commission. And uh, I want to give like 30 seconds because each of them has a very extensive background and uh, technical background in this field. I just want to give uh, 30 seconds for each of them. Just quickly kind of introduce 
uh, their role on their agencies and what they have been doing. So Chris Urban has uh, more than 25 years in different area in the clean energy uh, sector, including uh, high tech field from HVAC system to semiconductor manufacturing, to communication network and the smart grid. And uh, at the DOE Office of Electricity, he has managed over $1.7 billion grid modernization project. You know, back to 2009, and uh, uh, when have the Re um, American Recovery Actor, you know, Chris is one of the program manager and who help and work with a lot of utility deployed smart meters. And at OE Office of Electricity at DOE, uh, Chris leads the smart grid standards and interoperability effort, uh, including the green uh, the green button uh, consumer data access initiative, and uh, Office Electricity's dynamic control communication program. And we heard several times in last uh, uh, several panels regarding the transactive energy. So Chris is also leading the transactive energy portfolio at the Office of Electricity. Uh, our second panelist is uh, John Lochner at NASERDA. John is relatively new to NASERDA, joined NASERDA in 2019 as the Vice President for uh, Innovation. And he carried extensive career uh, in innovation, investment, and the strategic uh, consulting to NACERDA. And uh, he founded the Headland Advisors, which provide strategic advice uh, in the topic of sustainability focused opportunities. Uh, he was an investor and also advisors uh, to the business in water, energy, and the sustainable resource management perspective. Uh, he was the, on the leadership team on the NRDC, Natural Resource Defense Council, and also as an advisory position at uh, uh, Lucas Energy. His experience in renewable energy, including as a consultant to Department of Energy, and also board member and the executive committee member for Solar Energy Finance Association. And also he was an investment banker in the Global Energy Group at uh, uh, Credit uh, Suisse. Our third panelist is from California Energy Commission, Eric Stokes. Eric heads up uh, the branch at the California Energy Commission, which is called Energy Deployment and the Market Facilitation. And uh, his office, his team, and focus on the development and also management of a new strategic initiative to accelerate the deployment and adoption of a clean energy technology solution. And uh, one very famous uh, program at his office. Uh, if you're in California, a lot of entrepreneurs to get access to that program is called the Cal State program. And recently, and uh, uh, CEC and his office established another network platform, which is called Empower Innovation. It's the first pro uh, professional network platform uh, specifically for the clean tech uh, entrepreneurs. Now, in addition, you know, his office is responsible for several initiatives uh, which help to overcome technology, technology lock-in barriers that provide, prevent a broad adoption of clean energy technology, now, particularly focused on the low-income communities. And uh, also a couple of examples of the initiative is one of the very famous ones is Design Build Computation, which is uh, provide incentive to multidiscipline team, including like uh, architecture, engineer, and consulting firm to develop innovation of the design. So the format we're going to do is we'll start with federal, go to the state, and from east coast to the west coast. So I will hand this over to Chris as our first panelist to share his perspective regarding customer, customer DER integration and the data platform issue. Chris? Thank you, Liang, and uh, thank you, Omar, for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit today about uh, the digital grid and, and how DOE is trying to work in that space. Um, I wanted to first present you with a, with a nightmare scenario to try and focus our conversation a little bit. Um, and it's uh, something that uh, we, we used to do a long time ago, and we wish we could do some days uh, today. 
and that is uh, coming into a restaurant. Um, but in this scenario, unfortunately, uh, when you sit down, the waiter comes to you and they list every ingredient that they possess in the kitchen, every spice, every meat, every vegetable that they have purchased uh, over the recent time. In addition, the waiter goes on to detail all of the cooking utensils and the implements and the appliances that they have out back. And then the waiter asks the customer to tell them about their, uh, their life. And so she tells him about uh, her own life, her origins, her family's backstories, and how they're feeling today. And so basically an enormous amount of information has been exchanged and yet nothing particularly actionable has been done. Um, restaurants have solved this problem through the use of a menu. It is a focused statement of their capabilities in a way that they think is most actionable to the customer. The customer, in turn, looks at the menu and they process an obscene amount of information about how they're feeling, uh, how their father felt about curry and things like that, and all they do is they point at the menu and say what they want. So this is the interaction that we are seeking in the digital grid. It is not to maximize the exchange of data. It is to have an efficient interaction that produces actionable results at the end. So the language that we're looking to use in this um, that we've been working on is what we call grid services. Um, it is not a perfect language However, it is the language that we attempt to use to convey a minimum number of offerings to the customer as well as solicitations of things that they might be able to provide. And then the customer is welcome to interpret those grid services and determine whether the contents of their home or their business are capable and willing um, to provide those services. Again, is the thing that's important about grid services is it allows you to respect boundaries in the system, and then you minimize the exchange of information in order to deliver an agreement and in order to exchange those services in the most efficient manner possible. So that's kind of where I, I want to focus my discussion a little bit on this. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that grid services are about physics, time, and confidence. And if I were to expand it a little bit, we have physics, time, location, confidence, and value. And I would propose uh, to you that the most difficult area of research where the least progress has been made is in the domain of confidence. Um, and to a certain extent, it is the cause of our situation that we find in research and domains where we try to collect as much information as possible from the customer and from the customer's assets, streaming data back from inverters and things like that. It is because we don't trust the customer to interact with us, and so we want to use their data for them in some kind of a paternalistic way. Um, and I think that that is a, a defect in the way that we're pursuing this DER future to, uh, to a certain extent. However, um, we are trying still to get a hold on, on even the physics determinants. Is what is the minimum number of grid services that we could discuss with a customer um, that accurately express the needs of the utility um, at the time? And, uh, you know, in the environment that we have in some of our research projects, uh, the customer should probably ask for the switch status of all the uh, all the switches on the network and the reclosers and the transformer temperature, and the customer says, well, I'll determine what you need based on all the information that you've given to me. So we've got this unhealthy dialogue where the, the information needs to be needs to be compressed and acted on where it exists. And I think that's extremely important for ownership recognition, it's important for the sovereignty of the individual actors on our system that will always be separate from each other. Um, and it's important for, for privacy. Um, and while I'm still on the soapbox of uh, collecting too much data, is that 
confidentiality is not privacy. I've had proposals come in to us where they say, well, we're going to collect all the customer's data, but you wouldn't believe how well we're going to protect it. I mean, it's going to be very well protected. That is not privacy. That is confidentiality. So um, moving on to the, the confidence interval is that if, if the customer's DERs could make concrete guarantees of service to a utility, and they could do it in advance of when the utility needs those services, then we have a very healthy environment. We have a vibrant environment where the utility knows that they can rely on these services, these grid services products and things like that. In turn, however, there is an obligation for the utility to concisely and accurately represent its needs to the customer. If they're incapable of rep representing their locational temporal needs to the customer, then we have an impairment in the dialogue between these things. And of course, when it comes to negotiating a price, is if you can't define the product, then you're not willing to settle on a price. And so that's kind of the dimensions that I'm looking for, is if we can increase the confidence of this exchange, we can increase the accuracy of value and the performance of the grid services that we get back. So I wanted to pivot a little bit off of that and talk about where are the Department of Energy's R&D programs exploring customer DER integration. Um, most recently, we've uh, conducted the Electric Grid of Things FOA, the EGOT FOA, and awarded four, um, four projects. One of them is actually to, of course, Stanford. However, we also have Purdue University, Portland State University, and MIT, and all of them are looking at the Internet of Things at the grid edge, and it deals with the same set of issues as how can we interact across ownership boundaries in the absence of trust from time to time, as you're never going to be able to provide cybersecurity to the customer because the customer has sovereignty over their domain. However, they have things that you want, and we want to figure out the most efficient way to gain access to that flexibility. So the IoT at the grid edge is, is an active exploration in those projects. I've got two minutes left. I am keeping time on myself here. Um, we have also just launched the Energy Storage Grand Challenge. Um, and yes, there are a lot of bulk power discussions and capabilities within energy storage. However, energy storage has great potential down into the distribution system and, of course, at the customer locations themselves and have great ability to influence the stability and controllability of the grid. So I would look, uh, ask you to look to the Energy Storage Grand Challenge. Also coming up is the Connected Communities Funding Opportunity Announcement, which we're doing uh, under the leadership of the Building Technologies Office, but also in partnership with Solar, Vehicles, and, of course, my Office of Electricity. But we are looking to exactly look at this grid edge and the customer resources in new and more scalable ways. So if, uh, if you Google Connected Communities and the Department of Energy, um, hopefully within the next couple of months we will see a funding opportunity announcement come out that explores that. The other two elements that I'd mentioned, um, just quickly in taking a look at how are we exploring customer DER integra uh, integration, we're looking at it structurally through the discipline of grid architecture, um, which is led by uh, multiple national labs, but most notably Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, looking at observability of the grid and how can we interact with all this uh, high-scale DER interaction. And finally, I would mention the Grid Modernization Lab Consortium um, is a vibrant area of research where we have multiple national labs collaborating together, and it is funded by multiple program offices back at DOE. So it truly is a multidisciplinary effort and has had tremendous benefits um, and uh, research results coming out of it, both in the theoretical modeling and simulation, as well as projects such as um, networked uh, microgrids in Alaska and things like that. So with that, I will conclude my opening statements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate. So just a quick reminder, uh, for the attendees, you can submit your questions through the chat function 
at the bottom of the screen, and you can type question here. So we will try to finish. You know, each the pan each of panelists will have ten minutes to share their perspective on this topic. Then we will go to the Q and A session. So now I will hand this over to our second panelist, John Lockner from uh, Nasrda. Thanks very much, Liang, and thank you, Omar, as well. Um, and and thanks for everybody for tuning in. And and also a thank you to Chris for without coordinating, uh, teeing up some of the the things I'll be talking about. So. Um, I appreciate it. Um, just a, a brief overview of, of where New York is, because I think it's, it's important to how we are approaching uh, how we think about where the grid needs to go and on what timeline. Um, so here you can see uh, the New York State Clean Energy Goals. These are set out in uh, legislation that passed roughly about a year ago, the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act which became effective January 1 of this year. And the act commits New York State to the targets you see here, uh, some of which are resource specific and, and thus give the state and grid operators some sense of, of the roadmap to come. But, but the implications of, of the longer dated in particular goals, decarbonization in particular, uh, assume substantial electrification of the building stock and transport sectors. And that will obviously lead to quite a bit more um, uh, complexity in, in grid operations. Uh, here, just a brief overview of NYSERDA in, uh, innovation. So we are an $800 million fund that invests across climate technologies. Uh, on the left, you see the four types of innovation kind of as put out by Harvard Business Review and, and as kind of generally discussed. Um, given our climate goals, given the speed at which we need to meet these goals, uh, we are aiming at disruptive and breakthrough innovations, although we work in all four quadrants here in our roughly 600 ongoing projects. Uh, but more broadly, we're not just investing in specific R&D projects and startups. We are investing in systemic changes to enable innovation across entire sectors or across the entire state. Uh, again, going back to the scale at which we need to change and the speed at which we need to do it, uh, we simply can't just focus on individual uh, R&D investments. Uh, we, we need to unlock the private sector and, and yeah, other stakeholders, including higher education. Um, so for example, alongside investing in specific grid technologies, which we do continue to do, uh, we additionally work on supporting regulatory policies to enable accelerated adoption of all technologies onto the grid. And we're, we're thinking about similar interventions for higher education, uh, and for climate finance, where we believe there are opportunities to drive forward climate risk pricing models to systemically decrease financing costs for technologies that have lower climate related risks, whether transitional or natural catastrophe related. So related to, to the topic of, of this webinar series, I wanted to go into to two different initiatives happening in the state. Uh, one ongoing and one potential that we're currently exploring. Uh, the first here is the ongoing initiative, the New York State Department of Public Service Integrated Energy Data Resource, uh, which began as a multi-state industry-driven group tasked with understanding how supplying utility and grid data to a broader set of stakeholders could support the animation of new markets, technologies, and other innovations to support uh, the state's goals for the grid and the transformation of, of the built environment more broadly. The vision here is to provide a single centralized standardized data platform that provides data needs for existing and potential grid market participants so that they can be empowered to develop new business models, determine lowest cost solutions for grid upgrades, and provide customer benefits and, and customer value propositions. Uh, as an initial set of market objectives, the group chose uh, number one uh, to focus on being able to initiate DER solutions based on self-identified grid needs. So that's for the DER developer. Uh, number two, to be able to initiate DER solutions based on a customer interest signal. Uh, and number three, to better respond to utility initiated grid modernization opportunities. Each of these market objectives align with the REV objectives identified by the PSE in the state. Uh, the group has then built some use cases, some use cases, excuse me, around the high-level market objectives. 
The first use case is identifying locations where DERS can provide grid value via services to the grid. The second is to screen and identify potential customers in a scalable and cost-effective way. The third is to accurately calculate and optimize business cases to maximize customer and grid value. NYSERDA has just issued an RFI on behalf of the Department of Public Service uh, for this work, and we would, of course, welcome everyone's feedback here. Obviously, a very uh, relevant issue to everybody attending this. Uh, the RFI is 4501 for anyone who wants to quickly Google it. And we would expect to move forward on, on what we believe would be a multi-year implementation of this program, uh, assuming we get um, uh, the right feedback and, and the right sign-off from the Department of Public Service uh, in relatively short order. This is just a, a brief synopsis of, of to date how, how we got to where we are with this integrative data initiative. Uh, moving forward, uh, onto the second topic I wanted to, to mention on the webinar. So this is a basic graphic that, that at a very high level shows where does New York believe its grid needs to be based on its macro climate policy. So we would have electrified, as I mentioned, substantial portions of transportation and buildings. We would have connected those to the grid. Um, and we also believe a, a order of magnitude greater number of small-scale renewables and storage assets and other assets will be connected to the grid in, in ways that uh, there is no way to centrally plan for. So from a grid management perspective, uh, we're, we're really switching dynamics here. Uh, we're inevitably moving from a world on the left here, uh, a highly centralized grid, to a decentralized, and then at some point to a perhaps fully distributed grid where an increasing amount of grid activity could be bilateral, and may blur the lines between on and off grid. This poses, of course, a, a big challenge for how utilities and regulators currently operate the system, and in some ways requires the grid to become digital to enable the operations implied by the shift in system architecture. The requirement arises from, frankly, the sheer number and complication uh, of all of the activities that would be going on to the grid and the need for near, uh, near real-time orchestration of all of those activities to keep the grid balanced. Given the shift, we've asked ourselves, and we've had some, some consultants come in and give us some thoughts, including uh, Eric dressel Huiz and Craig Boyce, the, the former of which was a uh, smart grid tech entrepreneur with Silver Spring Networks, originally one of the founders, and Craig Boyce, who's been a, a consultant on innovation and uh, technology for decades. Um, and they've helped us think through, you know, how do we get the innovation we need onto the grid uh, to reach the goals that we know we have for 2040 and 2050 in particular. And this slide walks through some of our assumptions on this point. Uh, and our assumptions are that most of the tech that we need to get to particularly the 2030 goal already exists. Uh, it's either commercial or near commercial. Uh, however, even mature technologies with proven value propositions are not fully deployed. Um, in many instances, what large grid tech OEMs and startups lack is a market or price signal that would drive scaled deployment. And often what utilities may not have is clear direction from regulators as to how to choose technologies to implement given no clear functionality requirements. As with any market, clarity around size of, and market potential and policy drives action. So we in New York have the opportunity to catalyze the private sector to create and deploy all these great innovations that we know we need uh, for the future of our grid. We just need to provide the market clarity to get there. One of the paths forward we've been discussing, and, and this is very much in real time, um, is for the regulator alongside utilities and tech OEMs and other stakeholders to set future functionality requirements for, for instance, building to grid interactions um, and dates by which these functionalities must be in place. Uh, California has, of course, done similar work with solar inverter standards, for instance, through California Interconnection Rule 21. We believe by setting future functionality requirements, we can spur utilities and corporates to act. Corporates can develop their technologies to meet the required functionalities, knowing that if they do a good job, there is a market waiting for them, a scalable market. Uh, and utilities can assess these different technology options available to meet the requirements that they know they will be held to. 
with new functionalities come the opportunity, of course, for new business models and pricing signals and different types of interactions. So alongside functionality requirements at date certain in the future, we were proposing to develop a regulator sanctioned sandbox or bounded area in which regulators, utilities, and businesses could then innovate policy and pricing signals around these new required functionalities. So for example, a company might propose a business model that would reduce congestion on the grid using tech that meets certain new functionality requirements. And we could trial it alongside the regulator and utilities to determine what the value was to the grid and what the value was to customers. Given the pace of technological change, the pace of change of the grid in New York, uh, given that with a little bit more than 15 years from now, we are planning to have nine plus gigawatts of offshore wind. Uh, we currently have none. Uh, and many, many more gigawatts of land-based large and decentralized renewables and storage. We just made the largest procurement announcement for national or for, for U.S. renewables yesterday uh, for the state. Um, and we believe a sandbox can help us get the state and the industry to innovate at a greater speed towards the interactive grid that we believe we do, in fact, need to reach our policy goals. And so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And uh, now we're going to move from East Coast to West Coast. I will hand this to Eric of California Energy Commission. Great. Thanks, Liang. Thanks, Omar, for inviting me today to come talk. Um, as Liang mentioned earlier, my name is Eric Stokes. I'm with the California Energy Commission, uh, specifically the Research and Development Division. And the Research and Development Division is responsible for administering of the, uh, the state-funded energy R&D in California. Um, on average, we typically award about $150 million to $200 million in new funding each year. Um, our, our kind of flagship R&D program is a program called the Electric Program Investment Charge, uh, and this is our program for the electricity sector. Uh, this program is unique in that we actually co-administer this program with the three investor-owned utilities in California. Uh, as far as the CEC's administration of the program, uh, this is about $130 million in new funding each year. And we've kind of organized our investments in EPIC around kind of these six investment themes. Um, kind of this concept of digital grid really touches upon all six of these investment themes. On building decarbonization, uh, we're very focused right now on how do we unlock a lot more load flexibility out of these buildings to better respond to kind of what's happening on the grid, uh, especially as we're seeing a lot of solar PV come online. On grid decarbonization, decentralization, um, a lot of our early EPIC investments were focused on how do we better integrate, uh, how do we better integrate PV and wind into the transmission system, the types of tools needed at the ISO and at the utility level to do that. Uh, as we kind of going forward, we're starting to really focus on uh, kind of this concept of virtual power plants. Uh, we're seeing a lot of customer side solar PV and storage deployed in the state. And how do we better aggregate and optimize uh, those assets to you know, respond more like a traditional power plant? And then on the transportation electrification side, uh, we have a pretty good sized portfolio around vehicle grid integration. Uh, a lot of our research in the past has informed various communication and equipment standards. Uh, as well as developing some of these new powerful algorithms. Um, our original focus was on light duty, but we're starting to see uh, an, a push towards electrifying the medium heavy duty space as we look to meet some of our energy and climate change policy goals. And so uh, we, we have a couple of focused efforts coming out on that front. Um, going back really quick to uh, on the building decarbonization, we have a funding opportunity that's coming out to establish a low flexibility hub uh, and so that should be coming out in the next couple months. Uh, as Lee mentioned, one of our efforts in my office has been really focused around uh, clean energy startup companies. Over the past few years, we've set up a series of programs uh, to really try to stage gate new companies through kind of the energy innovation pipeline. Uh, our first touch point with a lot of these companies is our CalSeed program, which is uh, kind of our small grant program. Uh, we just recently accepted or selected the first uh, startup companies for our Cal Testbed program, which uh, essentially gives startup companies access to testing and laboratory facilities 
at the University of California campuses or LBNL if they're selected for the program. Uh, in addition, we have uh, two other programs to really try to stage gate these companies through, and we have the funding opportunities for these programs coming up pretty soon. One is Bridge, which is really helping startup companies make that transition from prototype into the pilot demonstration stage. And then kind of our last touch point is our ramp program, which is for companies that have uh, have a demonstration uh, and they're looking to scale up their manufacturing to kind of the pilot production level. And ramps are typically our last touch point with most startup companies. Uh, and then along the way, we have kind of a statewide network of incubator and accelerator programs, uh, including the Cyclotron Road program at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that help kind of guide these companies kind of along the pathway. Um, as we started to introduce a lot of these new technology solutions, we've also become very focused on some of the lock-in barriers and how do we start to engage some of these downstream actors that are going to be responsible for deployment of these kind of new emerging technology solutions. Uh, one example we like to give is solid-state lighting. You know, the first generation of solid-state lighting uh, was designed to basically look like an incandescent light bulb to overcome some of these lock-in barriers. But we're starting to see some real advancements in solid state lighting that really deviate from that kind of traditional form factor. Uh, but this is going to take some interventions with some of these downstream actors like architects are thinking, how do you spec, how do you design um, around some of these new emerging technology solutions? Uh, there are several tools that we use to try to overcome some of these lock-in barriers. One of those is informing codes and standards. Like John mentioned earlier, we did a lot of research to try to inform some of the Rule 21 Smart Inverter Standards. Uh, but one of the tools that we've used is design build competitions. Uh, we launched our first design build competition back in 2016. And the focus of this first one was for teams to design an advanced energy community. Uh, we had 13 teams that were selected for the design phase. And then we downscaled those to four teams that were selected for the build out phase of that, and these included projects in Richmond, Oakland, Lancaster, and then Basic Avocado Heights, which is a neighborhood in Los Angeles County. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these kind of four build-out projects. Uh, so the first one is Lancaster. Uh, this is a partnership uh, between the Community Choice Aggregator and the City of Lancaster, as well as their technology partners. Um, and essentially, for this project, they're going to be building two new all-electric residential communities that will be microgrids. Um, on top of that, uh, they're going to be retrofitting three schools to be microgrids, as well as installing uh, a storage program. A lot of the commercial industrial uh, customers within kind of the city of Lancaster. And kind of the big innovation is that all of these assets are going to be connected uh, to the Olivine uh, Derms management system uh, that will kind of optimize and manage all these various assets uh, including integrating with uh, the market. And then our next project is taking kind of a little bit of a different focus where Lancaster is focused on new development. Uh, the Oakland Eco Block is focused on retrofitting uh, an existing block in the city of Oakland uh, to essentially be a DC microgrid among 20 or so homes within that neighborhood. Um, Part of what they're looking to do is have a DC backbone for the community and have community storage. Um, and so uh, they recently selected their site, uh, their neighborhood site, and are gonna be starting installation in the next couple months, uh, followed by uh, what's gonna be some extensive MB testing to try to really understand some of the challenges and how we can scale this type of concept going forward. The other two projects are just kicking off. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of these projects is in Los Angeles County, a neighborhood called Bassett Avocado Heights, and, and the other is in Richmond. They're both doing similar efforts. Uh, essentially, what they're trying to do is transactive energy platforms. They're gonna be installing solar and storage as well as electric heat pumps in the homes of, in the case of Bassett Avocado Heights, uh, 50 residential homes on top of that, they're establishing a uh, central microgrid uh, for emergency response at a local church. And they're going to be trying to manage all these assets through a blockchain uh, type transactive platform. 
Uh, Richmond, uh, a few years ago, the city of Richmond uh, developed a social impact bond to uh, basically acquire uh, parts of the city that had become pretty blighted, and they're going to be renovating and rebuilding those homes to be zero net carbon. Uh, and as part of our project, those homes will be grid connected, uh, connected to the Olivine uh, Derm system. And with both of these, uh, there's going to be apps for residential customers, including a marketplace where they can buy grid edge connected technologies and various services through the app and be able to manage their energy use through a more simple user interface. Uh, as we're kind of getting these projects off the ground, we're also thinking about our upcoming design build competition. Uh, this one will focus on building decarbonization, which uh, we're looking at as one of our key strategies towards meeting our 2050 greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, for building decarbonization, you know, we think we have a pathway for low rise residential. But as you start to look to some of these other building segments, it becomes more challenging uh, on how we're going to get to zero emission. Um, on top of that, uh, we're dealing with some other impacts, which is climate change and how it's threatening our built environment, as well as some of the affordable housing concerns in the state. And so all these issues are going to come together in our next design build competition, which is focused on kind of your mixed use mid rise uh, building sector. And this will be looking to uh, we'll be looking to release this in the next couple months. And with my last couple of slides, I just want to put in a couple of plugs. Uh, we are hosting a virtual symposium on September 2nd and 3rd around building decarbonization. Uh, as part of that, there's going to be a big focus around load flexibility in buildings. Uh, we have a, uh, for those that are interested in applying to be a lightning talk presenter at the event, we have a link below and the top link is to registration for the event. And then as Lane mentioned, uh, Several months ago, we created a professional networking platform called Empower Innovation. Uh, most of, especially in the state of California, most of our funding is kind of scattered across various websites as well as events. And Empower Innovation kind of creates a more central place uh, for all of those funding opportunities, events, tools, and resources, uh, and it curates those based on people's specific interests and expertise. With that, I'll turn it back to Omar and Ling. Great. Eric, thank you, and Chris, John, great presentations, uh, um, and we're going to get some good discussion going on here. Uh, we have a, one question already in the Q&A. We will get to that, and others, if you have questions, you can either submit it through the chat feature or Q&A. Uh, just to get things started, a uh, question for all of you, maybe we can start with Chris and, and go in order. Uh, you know, how would you characterize the in general, taking a step back, the role of government-sponsored R&D in this space of advancing, um, you know, a shared, integrated digital grid. Uh, if you can maybe talk a little bit about how you establish your priorities and, in general, how you see the role of government-sponsored research uh, working with industry, academia, and other other stakeholders. So maybe Chris, starting with you, and then and then going across. All right. I just want to make sure audio is still good. All right. Um, so, in general, of course, you know, the, the Department of Energy is part of the federal government, and we take our cues from, uh, from the, the administration. And so there's been a lot of emphasis on resilience um, and on ensuring that uh, defense-critical infrastructure is counted as a, as a relevant stakeholder in the in the world and in our nation's infrastructure um, but it our our paths to supporting those agendas are still extremely diverse and represent sort of the the full breadth of the department of energy and so um, we have uh, we have efficiency plays we have um, bulk grid hardening initiatives we have um, an enormous simulation and modeling effort on the North American energy resilience model. Um, but the way that we pursue it is, um, is to, to look at the smallest parts of the grid as well, is what, ha what can DER um, contribute to improving the state of the grid and its reliability and resilience, and what, um, what potential dynamics does it present that are more of a challenge. 
But in general, the role of government is to stay out of the way of, um, of business and the normal course of events, and that generally takes the form of moving down the TRL levels to where the risk is higher and the reward is more uncertain. So in general, we tend to attempt to swing for the fences and fill in where there's no particular profit motive. Um, I think probably that's the, the easiest way. And then, you know, we do realize that we, we, we have tremendous resources um, as, a, as, a, as a benefit of, of the taxpayers of America. And so we try to use our money to seed innovation in areas that are out ahead of the curve. Um, so obviously the, the Internet of Things is, uh, is flourishing and, and extremely dynamic. And so we're, we're faced with the difficult task of what stake can we put in the ground ahead of the field um, that solves problems that, that lead, lead us in the right direction. And so really that's where we sort of try to focus on um, these boundary issues, these ownership issues, these security issues that shouldn't be solved through tr traditional means and should be solved through innovation. And I think I'll, I'll leave that to my, uh, my colleagues on the panel to talk about the rest of it. Okay. John? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with, with what Chris said to some extent for, for NYSERDA. We are looking to be catalytic. We are not looking to uh, overlap with what the private sector would do. We are looking to take on risks where the private sector has decided it will not take on those risks. Um, we are looking to seed innovation where we believe those innovations will bring substantial future societal benefits versus benefits to any individual company or, or industry. Um, and, and I will call out one that is both in our, in our decarbonization legislation, but also perhaps even more relevant given the pandemic, and that's affordability. Uh, there is a huge affordability issue in this country, and that's not going to get better after the pandemic. Um, and so thinking about how we create the, the most affordable grid and the most affordable decarbonized future is very important to us. Um, another area that NYSERDA innovation dollars are focused uh, are around solutions for the regulated utility uh, industry as well in particular. Um, we support the development of results uh, for the regulator to be able to make decisions, and we support the utilities in their R&D initiatives uh, because in New York State, they do not have unlimited R&D budgets and, of course, are not necessarily um, remunerated for taking R&D risk. Um, in terms of how we focus, I would say the, the, the new legislation, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act goals are a key driver of how we think about where to focus our innovation dollars. And then beneath those goals, the state has various um, uh, constantly shifting assessments of, of what the technology needs might be to reach those goals. And we are thinking ourselves about what do we think the, um, the, the largest changes will have to be in, in the different sectors of the economy to get to those goals where there are no existing incentives for the incumbents to, to really make those investments today and, and looking to, to play in those spaces. So this is Eric. I agree with everything uh, John and Chris said. Um, so for us, you know, our R&D investments are really driven by the state's energy policies. And on the electricity sector specifically, it's uh, a, a bill called Senate Bill 100 that put California on a path to um, essentially be get its electricity sector to carbon neutral by 2045. Uh, for R&D, I mean, it's, it's, we've operated on a couple of fronts, and one is how do we get there in the most effective and efficient way? And then it's looking at the types of technology advancements we'll need to get there and basically making those types of investments. Um, I think one of the values we've seen from our R&D programs is the ability to bring stakeholders together that might not engage with one another. Um, I think the other piece to that is, uh, you know, we're still very much in experimentation and to be able to share the lessons learned, especially from all our various pilot demonstrations and our projects uh, across, um, you know, one, one set of stakeholders to the other so that they're building on some of the things that have been learned and things that shouldn't be tried again. Um, it's been really valuable. As I think John mentioned, you know, there's limited R&D dollars and the more you can 
disseminate those findings and results uh, and avoid some of the mistakes, uh, the quicker we'll get to some of these goals. Thank you. Leanne? Terrific. Uh, so, you know, another question I have is kind of follow on what does Eric mentioned. So we're going to reverse order from Eric to John to Chris. So it's about, uh, you mentioned a lot of investment uh, uh, your office has is uh, still on the pilot stage. So the question is, how can we scale the digital transformation on customer D uh, integration? How we can go beyond the pilot? You no, know, really commercialize them, be adopted by the uh, utility or the um, retail provider or, or municipal utility or invest on utility. Then what do you see the areas or another push we need to go beyond the pilot? Yeah, I think a, a couple things. Um, one is, you know, one of the things we've tried to do in our design build competition is to replicate how these projects would get built and uh, in a, if they're happening in, real, in a more real setting um, and really try to engage not just the energy stakeholders, but how do you engage kind of this broader set of stakeholders into these projects? Um, one of the challenges and some of the examples we've seen, especially from our EcoBlock project, is how do you, there's a lot of benefits to some of these projects, but it doesn't always translate into a business model. Uh, in the case of the, uh, the Oakland EcoBlock project I showed in my presentation, the location they selected has a lot of value to the utility, both for their electricity service as well as their gas business. But how do you translate into how do you translate that benefit into a business model that allows you to scale that concept uh, more broadly? Uh, the other barriers, like I said, they're typically not technological. They can be social. They can be regulatory. Um, one of the challenges, uh, especially with this project, is they're pursuing a, a community financing district model uh, to be able to uh, finance parts of the project and maintain. Uh, maintenance and operation to those customer site assets after the CC funding um, is basically over. Uh, but it creates some interesting social dynamics. You basically need some trust in the community and among the various uh, residents that live there. One of the first projects that was selected for this, there was some tension between parts of the neighborhood block and it ultimately led to that project you know, even with the CEC funding that was going to basically pay for most of the capital costs, uh, the community at the end decided that this just wasn't something they wanted to pursue because of these kind of longstanding tensions. And it ultimately led to us trying to identify another site selection for this concept. Uh, uh, John, you know, you have a, uh, you also have an investment bank. Uh, experience before, and uh, uh, can you share a little bit more about uh, you know when we push go beyond the pilot? What other any sectors we need to engage or players we need to engage to help commercialize some of these technologies? Sure, and, and I would I would go back to to some of my comments in my presentation, which is I think the regulator holds the the keys here. Um, Utilities make extremely rational decisions based on how they are regulated and based on what their shareholders are looking for and their obligation to their shareholders. Um, if, if the regulator provides utilities functionality requirements that they are mandated to meet in the future and utilities are given the opportunity to try out uh, with some degree of um, with some degrees of freedom around the risks they take and failing, uh, they will move towards the, the future state that, that we all want them to go towards. Um, somebody uh, described to me pilots as industrial tourism. And I talked with a major utility recently um, where I asked them what the goals were of a pilot that they were spending millions of dollars on. Uh, and their answer was, oh, we don't have any specific goals. We want to see what happens. Uh, well, okay, then I, I think that tells you where that pilot's going. Um, I think pilots need to be part of a process. And, and I think there's a very different process in, in many utilities around how they would look at bringing in new transformer technology or a new CRM system and how they think about developing a transactive grid. Um, and, and I think that that squarely falls on the regulator providing them very different incentives and a very different structure 
uh, in terms of getting to those two end states. Um, so I, I would say it's scalable and it's about redesigning the regulatory process. Perfect. Uh, Chris, anything you want to add here? Well, one thing I'll add is uh, in the difference between the <clears throat> What you're selling and what you get is, I think John actually wins the award that is, his bio photo actually is the, the most faithful representation of him as a person. And I'm definitely in very last place um, on that. Um, however, when it comes to your question, Liang, is uh, I, I think that there are, there are sins that are uh, committed during the pilot stage that, that we allow to be committed that hamper um, forward progress. Um, in, in many pilots is um, engineers can touch every device and they take advantage of that capability and they go and they touch every device or they personally install them and they troubleshoot them and things like that. And so getting, getting the work done um, is a barrier to scalability because they don't think about uh, the plan for no touch installation or they don't give it sufficient attention. They're, they're so obsessed over getting connectivity over these 400 devices that they can't imagine how you do it over a million devices. And so there are technological sins that are committed in the pilot stage that are sometimes unrecoverable. Um, there are also, uh, getting back on my soapbox, there are sins of data collection where in the conduction of research, we collect a tremendous amount of data and that is necessary for the project and things like that. However, um, there's no way in the real world that you could or should collect all of that information. And very few researchers give time and attention to the fact of how will these technologies live in the real world with real people. Um, and so uh, I, I have that in a project I've got going on right now is that they're collecting terabytes and terabytes of data on houses because they've got this unique permission arrangement and things like that. But they have not presented me with a clear plan of how they can go to uh, an environment where you only get 5% of that data. And so we've got a scalability issue that's immediately available, uh, visible within the technology. Um, and that also brings us to uh, issues of, of privacy and customer sovereignty is that the researchers sometimes presume too much uh, control is ceded to the utility or to the aggregator than a customer would be comfortable with um, in the tens of thousands. Um, you will always get a customer who's willing to cede complete control to the utility um, because they get a couple of new GE appliances and it's only for a few months kind of arrangement. So violations of ownership boundaries are a good way of looking at pilot projects and getting a, uh, an indication of whether they are going to succeed in the real world. So I'd, I'd sort of stick in those grounds and acknowledging the regulatory and some of the other barriers that continue to exist. Great. Terrific. So I'll Thank hand you. it to Olma. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I want to invite uh, folks on the line. Please submit your questions uh, via the chat or the Q&A feature. We will get to the questions uh, here momentarily. I want to ask another uh, question for, for everyone. And this is related to the issue of um, uh, sort of equity, social equity in, in R&D. Uh, we're all aware of the digital divide that exists that we speak about uh, integrating customer resources, uh, understanding that uh, some of these uh, resources, when we speak of PV, electric vehicles, uh, other kinds of customer technologies uh, may not be economically accessible for, for uh, some segments of the population. So uh, just was wondering if you get some perspectives on how you balance your portfolio and and objectives with this sort of uh, uh, in the context of social equity and other, I know you've all mentioned community-based projects, things that can uh, help to bridge that divide. So uh, maybe you could start with John on this one and then go to, to uh, Chris and then Eric on, um, on some of these issues. Uh, you know, how, how is that dealt with in, in New York? Maybe John, starting with you. Sure. Um, I think first, first and foremost, when, when we think about using 
uh, our resources and, and they're vast compared to other states, but they are still de minimis compared to the size of, of the challenges. Um, we have to be looking for scalable markets and scalable solutions, which kind of by definition means uh, a lot of what we are funding will end up being a benefit to uh, all, all rate payers and all citizens of New York State. So that, that, that's kind of an overarching perspective on innovation um, for, for us. Having said that, we do, you know, when we look at in our in our home turf, uh, so to speak, um, we can see that there are certain issues or there are certain communities that are going to have bigger issues with climate change more quickly and where we need to, we, we, we have a perhaps a moral obligation and also a legal obligation now with, with religion, um, to really focus on supporting those communities in, in what we call a just transition. And so, for instance, and, and this goes back to the pandemic again, um, cooling is a big issue. There are many public cooling centers in uh, less well-off parts of New York City. Uh, there is no opportunity, however, for proper social distancing in those cooling centers. And so we are dealing with a large percent of people who now have no place to cool themselves this summer while we're reaching uh, new, new heights in terms of temperatures. And so when we think about some of the innovation priorities that we need to have in the state, we look at that and we say, well, we know we have to cool buildings in a cost effective, energy effective, climate effective way anyway, but here's an opportunity to focus a program now on a particular part of our population that urgently needs something. And so can we design a program that gets us to our long-term goals while solving a near-term urgent solution as well? So that's another way we're thinking about deploying some of our capital. Uh, and lastly, I would say I, I actually also run transportation for NYSERDA, uh, not just R&D, but also other aspects of the work. And there we are very focused on air pollution as, as one of our goals for mitigation. And so when we think about where to fund solutions, um, we, we think about taking diesel trucks uh, off, off the market, and particularly in disadvantaged communities where, uh, in particular in New York, many of those trucks are parked in disadvantaged communities, even if they run uh, in other areas most of the day. Um, we also think about mobility and access to work. Um, and, and again, that, that kind of dovetails with electrification when we think about shared e-bikes, shared e-scooters, improved access to public transport, and all of those solutions, of course, drive down vehicle miles traveled, uh, drive town, other costs, and, and, um, and energy use more broadly when we look at our models. Thanks. Chris, your, your thoughts on the uh, social equity as it relates to R&D in this space? I'm going to cede the bulk of my time to Eric because he probably can address this a little bit better. In general, the way we pursue our research is that we, we go to lengths to ensure that um, all uh, proposers from all walks of life are capable of proposing um, offerings, and so that goes from the, you know, a, a disadvantaged rural utility um, with uh, with with its resulting customer base as being a, a viable player in our research portfolio um, calls and things like that. However, we don't have any specific mechanisms for um, assuring or measuring measuring social equity in the in the execution of our research agenda. So this is Eric. So with our, uh, especially with our EPIC program, we actually have statutory direction that uh, prescribes a minimum amount of funding that needs to go to projects that are in a, uh, what they call a Cal virus screen disadvantaged community or a low income community. Um, so we, we've kind of implemented those requirements through the solicitation process uh, in our solicitations, having specific carve outs for projects located um, in one of those location in locations that meet one of those two criteria um, or by awarding bonus points to applicants um, if they you know do a demonstration project in in one of those locations um, what we found over the years is that communities become a little bit of an afterthought uh, you'll get a technology developer or you get a systems integrator that you know they basically have the project designed and it's just finding a location um, what we've heard from a lot of these communities is they want to they want to be involved and they want to be engaged earlier in the design and make sure that the project and the technology meet their priorities. So uh, one of the things we've been setting up is really to try to better engage with these communities and provide kind of more of a forum for them to be involved 
not more of an afterthought in the project, but more at the beginning of the project. Um, from the state perspective, we can't really do that type of matchmaking, but we can set up the forums and uh, some of the platforms that can enable uh, communities to basically uh, describe what their priorities are for their community and to try to um, engage with technology developers or other solution providers that would want to partner with them on a proposal to us under one of our funding opportunities. So one of the things um, we, I'm, oh, go ahead, Chris. Sir, Eric, I was just going to say, um, yeah. one of the best things that I did see in this domain was uh, in a project that we did down in New Orleans and that uh, the city government made their first foray into looking at smart grid projects by engaging with um, with low income community uh, community organizers. So they actually set, provided contracts to these community groups that are already in the low income community and they worked backwards where they actually used them as their agents in the community, explored energy issues, and then those people became the source of some of the challenges and problems, but then they also became the agents that Entergy interacted with the low income community through. So it was almost a recruiting of channels, a channel strategy to gain access and the trust of the low income community and not to have it be papered over by, I've got a technology, where can I drop it? Yeah, sorry. And that, yeah, and that, that's a great point. And not always been a lot of cases, sometimes uh, community-based organizations, which as you mentioned, Chris, are kind of those organizations that are acting on behalf of the community. A lot of times we'll engage with them and sometimes uh, almost re require a CBO to be part of the project, uh, just so that they have a stake and they're able to have some say into to what that project does. The other thing, uh, on our solicitations, we've developed some criteria that to really, um, to make sure that it's not lip service that we're getting. We basically, when people submit a proposal, we really wanna know to what extent they've engaged with the community and to be able to describe that and what the benefits are gonna be to that community. Leang, over to you. Terrific. Uh, now we're going to start to uh, answer some questions through the Q&A. And uh, uh, the first question, I think, is to uh, John uh, Nasrda. Basically, how do you foresee the sandbox evaluation criteria initiative improving the planning, design, implementation of demonstration to maximize the outcome and generate better lessons learned? Uh, sure, and, and I would I would say it's probably a little bit too early for me to get into too much detail there, uh, but I think the idea is that we're looking for a, a situation where utilities, the regulator, and other stakeholders can rapidly test and pivot, um, whether it's business models, pricing signals, technologies, functionalities, um, and so setting that up with, with the right folks and the right process, again, is something we haven't done yet. Um, but, but that would be the goal is, is to, um, by design, have it be something like a pace accelerator, uh, something like uh, if you think about um, coding, um, that, that by design it would be uh, structured in a way to, to get us that speed that we need. Thank you. Uh, Omar, uh, you know, if, uh, please allow me to ask another question. And uh, so if you recall in the last several panel discussion, we talked about transactive energy. And uh, uh, be more specific, last week, uh, Terry Oliver, the former CTO of BPA, and asked about uh, this question as well. So I would like to hear uh, Chris and also Eric touch a little bit on the blockchain project you have. You know, can you elaborate first is what is the definition of transactive energy? That's the first question. Second is uh, can you elaborate a little more about ongoing uh, research in this field? Chris, first, and Eric, thank you. All right, all right. I was going to let Eric go first, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so. Transactive energy is, you know, we, we try not to, to make it too too complex, but of course the uh, Grid Architecture Council has a, 
a lovely definition that we rely on from day to day. However, um, it means that you are compensated for the, the benefits that you provide to the utility, and the utility is compensated in, exchange, in turn for the benefits that it conveys onto you. Um, really what we're talking about when we look at transactive energy related uh, in juxtaposition to demand response is that the resolution of the, of the service needs is dramatically better. It's not at a regional level where you say, you know, we just turn off some thermostats and things like that. It is extremely targeted to the explicit control and load needs of the utility. Um, in addition is that the flexibility in the customers' homes and businesses that is sourced um, is extremely diverse and very precise as well. And so really, it's just a platform for allowing, you know, um, a requirement for a service and the provision of a service to occur in advance of when it is required and at very precise quantities. That's, that's sort of my quick definition of transactive energy. And then I think I'd like to bounce over to Eric for what he's doing and then I can, I can finish off. Yeah, so um, at least as kind of we see transactive energy, it's this concept of a prosumer where people aren't just uh, getting electricity, they're actually engaging with the electricity system on a much more dynamic level than kind of the previous, if you're a customer, you get electricity and you pay for it, where this is much more dynamic. Um, to your point, Ling, about the blockchain, I'm not sure yet. I quite understand blockchain. Um, and uh, so I'd be curious if anybody can explain it to me. Uh, but one of the things they're going to be doing uh, as part of this Bassett Avocado project, and with most of our projects that are these transactive energy, they're, they're simulated markets to a degree because we don't have those market structures yet um, for people to take advantage. For a while, there was a pilot um, program called the DRAM program, which was uh, allowing for these types of kind of prosumer transactive platforms. Um, but for the most part, like with this blockchain project, it's going to be a simulated uh, transactive energy platform. Uh, one of the things this blockchain will allow is for trading of carbon credits. Um, among the various prosumers in the network. Um, and it still, like I said, it remains to be seen how this is actually gonna work. It's still very much a pilot demonstration project just in a very real world setting with uh, real world households and especially low income households, um, most of which are uh, Hispanic speaking. So um, it, it's gonna be, you know, this is, it'll be interesting to see how the, uh, the community-based organization uh, and the technology developers and the partners engage with the residents in this neighborhood about a concept that's you know it's challenging for me sometimes to get my head around and how do you how do you convey this to uh the residents in some of these communities so i'll i'll just uh just sort of take it back up first of all is the uh the mantra that i'm sure everybody repeats in the mirror every morning is that blockchain is not transactive and transactive is not blockchain is that um, blockchain is a tool, it's a wonderful tool, everybody loves it, um, but it is not the, the, it does not represent the full total of a transactive system. Really, the people who have, who have gone the farthest with retail level transactive platforms is a company called TNO um, in the Netherlands, and it is where they have, they have actually implemented residential level transactive platforms where they are using value as an incentive to provide not just a load management but a control resource to the grid operator. And so that's as, that's as real as it gets and we have not gotten to that stage. Um, we have built a transactive energy simulation platform which is of course a merger of power system simulation communications as well as wholesale and retail markets. So we're, we're trying to provide an open simulation platform where you can look at a blockchain technology, you can look at another market technology and compare them, which is of course the, the most uh, challenging part of it. And of course we're exploring transactive energy in the, in the EGOT FOA um, in a couple of different locations, but uh, MIT is probably pushing that uh, envelope a little bit further. 
Thank you, Chris uh, and Eric. Oma? Yeah, so um, question, we have about 10 minutes left and uh, reminder to folks to please submit your uh, questions. We, I guess we have a shy group, uh, not as many uh, questions coming in, but, but that's okay, I've, I've, I've got a question here. And um, it's uh, related to uh, coordination of state uh, sponsored R&D and, and federal government sponsored R&D. So John, Eric, you both manage very large, diverse um, R&D portfolios uh, for you know, very large uh, states. Um, is there a role that you see, or how do you see coordination with, with Chris and his colleagues at DOE and others at the federal level in uh, coordinating roadmaps or other issues? So maybe John, starting with you and then Eric uh, on that. And then Chris, likewise, uh, the flip side of that is, is there a role that state R&D uh, can have in coordinating and providing input to you and vice versa? So maybe John, starting with you. Sure. Um, we, we love federal R and D. Um, they have more money than we do. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I'll go back to a comment I, I mentioned around, around, um, driving technology adoption on the grid and, and, and technology commercialization, you know, the bigger the market, uh, the more companies stand up, look and pay attention and start spending money in that direction. And so when we can be in concert with, uh, what federal dollars are doing, uh, that uh, technology segment or sector um, has, a, I think, greater chance of, of actually making it to, to scalable deployment. Um, in, in practice, quite a bit, if, if different parts of DOE, ARPA-E um, have funding opportunities, um, we do, I think, two things. One is we will, we will co-fund. Um, and so we and, and different parts of, of the federal government, I think, have cost share requirements on a regular basis. And so we will provide that cost share uh, in certain cases, um, and, and something else we do is uh, ARPA E tends to focus on earlier stage TRL, CRL than than NYSERDA, and we will uh, hopefully pick up the baton in certain cases from work that they have done and and move it uh, through the next different uh, couple of levels of TRL towards towards again scalable commercialization. Um, the the last thing I would say is, is just um, it, from a from a market signaling perspective, again, I think it's important, although very difficult, for the state. Uh, if I will speak for New York State and ICERTA, um to to coordinate with other states and with the federal government on specific initiatives and and uh, roll out a coordinated marketing uh, platform around focus areas. But where that's possible, I, I think it's tremendously valuable. This is Erica. Um, so similar to what John mentioned, we provide cost share for California applicants that are applying for federal funding opportunities, as well as, um, like I said, we have an MOU with RPE, and so we found ourselves to be a good handoff for some of the uh, technologies that they've funded. Um, kind of one of the areas of coordination, I, I think there's kind of more of the staff-to-staff -staff coordination and kind of the sharing of best practices and how we structure some of these programs, um, a little bit of the lessons learned from some of the investments we've made. Um, also, at the Energy Commission, we're responsible every two years for submitting to the legislature and the governor what's called the Integrated Energy Policy Report, which um, you know, provides you know, kind of a, essentially it's policy recommendations to the legislature, to the governor. Um, a lot of these issues with the digital grid are, re are going to require some policy and regulatory changes. Um, I think bringing in experts from other state agencies, from the Department of Energy into some of the, uh, the workshops public workshops that we do to kind of bring those perspectives in uh, is really valuable. Great. So for, for my part is that, you know, it's a, um, there's, there's no way that we uh, can coordinate these, these institutional processes and things like that. Um, and, and state sovereignty is a, is, is very important. And so they, they deserve to pursue their own mission and agenda and things like that. I think one constructive thing we might consider is um, we are all working on the energy sector and we are all going to confront some of the same scaling issues. And so there might be some benefit in ensuring that regardless of what you ask your proposers to do, um, that you have some common requirements such as a security, a cybersecurity plan submitted 90 days after award subject to acceptance by your organization, a privacy plan, 
same definition. And finally, um, very essential for, for scaling is an interoperability plan. Interoperability is not security um, and it is not privacy, but it is, it is a dog whistle to people saying do not use your proprietary interfaces, your proprietary standards, because it will meet with a, with a poor end in the scalability question overall. Um, so I think that there may be some institutional processes we might be able to take a look at and, 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 and use that as our uniformity as opposed to our mission goals. Great. We have a couple of questions that have come in and a little bit of time left, so probably have to go more rapid fire here. Liang, do you want to uh, address uh, uh, one yes. of the questions? Yes, let me see. Uh, I think this is a group that really uh, warm up very slow anyway, <laughs> but uh, there's several questions coming. Uh, so I'd like to pick one question here, kind of let everybody, the panelists, to close uh, your thoughts. So. When we talk about customer DER, for sure that we are going to see newcomers like, uh, uh, you know, third-party aggregator. We already see that, and uh, uh, maybe we have uh, more retail uh, providers which don't own any lines of transmission or distribution, and maybe completely different uh, uh, player in the future to who own a lot of customer DER, not own, who aggregate a lot, a lot of customer DER and interact with utility. And then how do you hold these providers to ensure the service? Because keep in mind, utility still the, you know, has a responsibility to keep the light on. And uh, we do, a uh, utility do really well in the past. And uh, we have the trust they are going to keep doing that. And, uh, uh, you know, how do you see that this provider can ensure the service of the quality to both the grid and also the customers. So, um, and uh, I see Joe, Joe Wallagorski in there. It's, it's good to see his, his name again. And basically is that no utility should pay for a service where the dimensions of the service are in doubt. They, you should not pay top dollar for something that you can't, you can't rely on. Um, and so that's, that's been essential to me is that if, if a customer is willing to be a resource, then they also need to commit to the performance penalties that come with non-performance of those things. And um, customers have tremendous capabilities, but they need to be held to the same level of account that eventually the utility will be held to. Um, one of the instruments that we've been trying to figure out over time is the concept of smart contracts in the blockchain space. And really, it's one of the only things that, that, that interests me deeply in the blockchain space is a smart contract is a contract in software where not only does the customer sign up to quantity and the negotiated price, but there are the details of that is if you do not perform in time, if you do not perform in quantity, then there is a penalty associated with that because you have impaired my control surfaces. And so it's really that, that confidence interval that I talked about at the beginning mm -hmm. is if the utility can precisely state its requirements and put that into the service requirements contract, then the customer can choose to sign up to those or not sign up to those. And that's what makes a market effective is the delivery of the service and the provision of it with guarantees. John and Eric? Yeah, I would, uh, Chris, I think you, you said it all. Uh, I think of it no differently than any other marketplace. Um, if, if I use Uber, uh, all the time and every time it comes when it says it's going to come and the car is clean and everything, then I continue being a customer and they continue making money. Uh, if one of the other side breaks down, then the contract doesn't work anymore. And so it's about making sure those contracts are, are quite clear. Um, and, and frankly, I think in, in the future, a lot of it will likely be automated to the point where um, it will be I think, very easy. Uh, but, well, but for the time being, uh, cl clarity is, is, is extremely important. And on, on top of that, just like that Uber example, is that um, five-star Uber drivers um, are, are more sought out. And so there is a way of, of rating the credibility of DER providers over time. 
And uh, the less reliable you are as a DER provider, the lower price you can command in the market, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah, this is Eric. And I think one of the questions I think we'll find out, at least with some of our projects that we don't know, is what are customers willing to accept? Uh, they, they might sign a smart contract, but are they really willing to abide by some of the uh, some of the requirements of that contract? Yeah, and, and to me, just like a um, a long term cell phone plan or some other plan, there's a there's a prepayment penalty or a cancellation penalty, and and the market yep. continues. Yep. yep. Terrific. Omar, I, think I will hand this over you, to you to wrap up the session. Yeah, this is fantastic. I. I like they always say, I wish we had more time. I really do, because especially since we're getting great questions at the end. But I just want to thank uh, each of you, Chris, John, Eric, for a great session. And I just want to uh, read out one of the final really comments here, because I think that this echoes, I think, uh, our sentiments as moderators and everyone else. It's, it's all three of you. We want to thank all the agencies you represent for, con for conducting your activities in very transparent and accessible ways, maximizing digital capabilities to inform and reach out broadly to get input and increase participation uh, by and from all stakeholders. So with that, thank you all for a great session. Uh, Chris Irwin, John Lochner, Eric Stokes, on behalf of Liang and myself, I wanna thank all of you who uh, participated in this webinar. A reminder that uh, this, the presentation and the recordings, the recording will be uh, put on the EPRI website. You can access it from the Stanford uh, uh, Bits and Watts uh, website as well. So with that, uh, thank you all for your participation and to our great panelists. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.